So, I hope everyone hears me. Well, you guys, you're granted, but online as well. Is anyone checking that screen thing? Can you check the chat if there is something? Uh, um, oh, ah, yeah, there's something there. I see something pinging. Let me just generously open the chat. We can uh, hear you, yes. Two times, yes. That's good. Try to pull the chat on my side so I'm more attentive to it. Okay. Um, first questions first, progress. 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 Everyone on board? Assignment one? Does everyone know the SS assignment one? Is that cloud as well? Or? No one knows. All right. Okay. So the more the merrier, I guess that's the metaphor here. Um, so now good. Everyone is somewhat on board. Um, any major hiccups in your progress? Chat, please. I'm always looking at the wrong thing because I'm expecting people to sit behind one of those monitors, but they're not actually sitting behind here. So there we go. Okay, um, so there was one, there were a few questions that came up, uh, most notably um, related to our requirement to make, after submission deadline, of course, make your repositories uh, accessible. And uh, granted, students figured out that public is not really an option because it's, you know, constrained with we had our login, uh, basically the uh, uh, GitLab instance that we have and use. So there is some refinement of the characterization that is offered in the issue managing Prescript uh, permissions of project. Uh, Marge posted that because it equally applies to students in uh, the advanced programming course, right? So some of you. Are, so it's a kind of the same problem, and uh, he, he highlights how to actually approach this. So the idea is that uh, you guys have um, basically there's a workspace in the works. We'll talk about hierarchy today, so that will come back to us. So there's a workspace in which students can work. All of you guys have your individual. Um, a subgroup they're in, right, which is your individual student's workspace named after your uh, uh, login and your new, or login that you used in any case on the um, GitLab instance. And then therein you can create an arbitrary number of projects. Uh, it turns out you need to set the workspace first to internal, so visibility internal. So we have three visibilities in GitLab. One is public, one is private, and the other one is internal. Internal means uh, any user who is uh, authenticated against the system can see that work. So that would be the uh, first modification needs to be done. The second one needs to be on the project level then, right? So we have the, um, uh, the workspace that you have individually and it's set it to internal after deadline and this particular project then um, as well. That's your assignment one. So it should be any case. But again, we can iterate over this when uh, closer to the time. I just want to um point you to that in case you're wondering how that's supposed to happen can we pin actually uh issues i'm not sure whether it's something i probably need to figure out but that's worthwhile reviewing so that particular issue managing permissions of projects anyway if that goes you know somewhat sideways we'll figure it out uh before before uh, anyone um uh, panics that shouldn't be a reason for concern the other aspect i want to do uh, point out is uh, I hope that everyone is somewhat signed up in the meantime to the submission system. I know it's a bit of an arduous process, yet another sign up, but uh, also hopefully the final one, because we shouldn't have any other system that you need to commit to anymore. Um, there are a few students who still need to be confirmed. I will do that now. And um, hang on. So I need to watch that I'm not uh, admitting you twice because that would be slightly unwise. Because then I have a mix, mix up with all your different accounts. So there were a few outstanding requests I just confirmed. Uh, but other than that, I think people are largely on board with this. So um, and the assignments have also been submitted already. Submission here high, uh, means just log on, post your link there, perhaps a comment or not, who cares, submit this thing and then revisit it before the deadline again, right? So you will have an opportunity just to update those links at any time. I would still recommend you to do it as early as possible, even if you don't have a sensible link yet, at least we see that, or you see that the submission works, which just makes your life a lot more comfortable uh, when it comes to a deadline, because ideally you should be more or less done by the deadline with submitting it. Anyway, that's the uh, same story I told last time. I hope that's clear. Uh, is there anyone else who experienced other, other than, of course, needing to be approved first, um, challenges in um, with the submission system because there may well be which we may not have noted yet no it sounds okay for now 
anyway, just interrupt me if there's something on the chat, and because uh, I may not be as it's always a matter of me organizing my um, windows here, and sometimes that's not in the favor of everyone else. So, okay, so we're largely on board. Um, to this stage, you have. Um, Oh, what did we do actually in the last few sessions? Exactly, I, I forgot. Please, anyone? API Sorry, again? API design. API design. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. What kind of API design? Well, which specifically, we only use this REST API design, right? I want to be clear. API is not API, also in web, there's in the web technology area slash cloud technology area, there are right. various APIs that may not only be REST. What alternatives are there as well in the sphere, in, in the field? GraphQL. GraphQL is one of them. Yeah, we'll look into that as well. A few sessions down the road, at least get a feel of it. It's a different uh, API and that has its uh, value as well in the space. We get back to that in any other APIs that you are, may or may not be aware of. Maybe a way of, otherwise you probably wouldn't answer that question. Or, uh, like library programming language. You mean generic libraries for yeah. right? Yeah, that has been for a long time the the best practice in the field, right? So that yet people come up with their library based on SOAP requests. Does anyone know SOAP? No, it's kind of ah. There's some. I saw something blinking. What blinked there? Drivers. Ah, drivers. The framework. Ah, okay. Yes. That's right. Um, yeah, in how far they're standardized, I'm not sure though. That's a matter of uh, discussion. I'm looking more for like um, standardized um, APIs. Um, the other one is, uh, yeah, again, SOAP, which is basically an XML based format where it's mostly based on request response encoding. So it, 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 um, uh, the, the idea is basically they have more like a classical encoding of um, control commands, for example and data in one request remember that rest separates both right it, it has the resources embedded in the request itself and the methods kind of part of the envelope so but it's um the the key difference there that it was merely a specification but no api looks like any other and in rest case it's a bit more generic and intuitively and kind of you know debug well pokeable <laughs> i guess you can just explore APIs uh, on the fly. Anyway, so we looked at some best practices. What's what? What are some of those to bear in mind for uh, particular for our assignment one submission? Hint. Please. Error handling. handling. Yes, it took me a while. I need to pass. So uh, I'm not used to listening to people in real life anymore. It's just everything is like you know two millimeters from my from my, from my ears. So I don't have this necessity or ability anymore to listen over a larger distance yes but error handling of course right what is part of error handling what what are practices you know no he's not so um what what are practices um that you should follow when you design your assignment one or any rest uh, api in the first place the error message does not uh, tell the user what's the error and also does not expose your uh, good okay so yeah. one person attended great so uh, so the, um, the idea was uh, having very explicit and clear error handling. So being explicit about the issue, perhaps in pointers to solutions, who knows, right? Depending on the specificity of your problem, but without exposing um, system internals, right? That was the main point. Um, and the other aspect uh, that we talked about from the machine readability point of view, what are we using there? Uh, error, codes. error codes, right? So and ideally the most specific ones um, that are applicable to your problem, right? So because they carry distinctive semantics, where are the semantics and meaning of error codes? Where are they specified? Oops. In Google? In practice, yes. In, in, yeah, yeah. In uh, IFC is the correct answer, right? So which club? Which clubs IFC? Because IFC is not a brand. That's like a generic way of saying. What does IFC stand for again? Request for comment. Cool. And. Um, which RFCs are the most relevant ones here? Yes, and which organization published that one? Is that uh, ED department or NGNU? I could set out some RFCs. I can. I don't know, I can, but the other club, right? So perhaps any comment? No, IATF, anyone? Internet Engineering Task Force, right? So I don't want to 
uh, for but there, there are various of those standardization organizations. You want to be comfortable with some of them and know what they do and what they exist and what they focus on um, as well. So that would be classical exam style questions because we wouldn't have anything else to ask, I guess. Um, but that's something you want to be comfortable with to know where to look, right? And if, yes, even, uh, well, not even, I will make reference, and I have already in the past slide made reference to Wikipedia because they do a good job in describing things in a human accessible manner. However, it's not a primary resource, right? It's a secondary resource. You always need to be aware. If you really want to figure out the truth, you need to dig a sli slightly bit deeper, right? So then that. So that's the main point. Okay. Last session, best practices, rest, talked about the different methods. Which methods do we have? Most. Yeah, and there's two that are very similar but different. Uh, and, um, patch. Yeah, good. Okay, difference? What's the difference? Uh, patch checks to see if uh, whether your patching is there or not, and uh, but it just like creates it. Uh, okay, so which one is richer in functionality, put or patch? What do you mean by richer? richer what, 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 which one has more features? What? Which one does more? And which one does less? Because I, I'm still don't want to. Patch would uh, be more because it checks to see. Uh, uh, I guess it checks to see if there's great like information. Uh-huh. I mean, okay, I, 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 miss, I misphrased this question, but the, the, the point I want to get is that one of them actually does add the information if it's missing, right? Even right. though it's uh, unambiguously identified using a unique identifier, the other one only allows for the modification if it really exists, right? It wouldn't create it, right? Which one is the one that creates? Uh, good. Yeah, exactly. Put creates and changes, patch only changes, but no creation. So that's a key distinction. Uh, okay, I think the rest should be clear, right? So quite straightforward. Okay, so you have everything to finish assignment one anyway. So we're looking slightly further. And um, what's one important aspect that we haven't kind of really dealt with in the course so far that you think you need to know in order to write services on your own or richer services, put it this way. What do you do when you use this, um, the, the APIs that we have provided you so far? Uh, you're only getting, you're not, you're not posting. Exactly. Yeah. You're only getting stuff, right? So you're only using other people's services, right? And representing as your own service, right? So perfect plagiarism, isn't it? Huh? Yes. So that's how the business work works. So jokes aside, but of course, you would possibly license the use or not if it's openly available and reform and provided. But you're absolutely right. So uh, currently, you're only getting information, right? So there's no modification um, for pushing information. Of course, we have the methods on REST, right? So we are aware of those, right? How we could formulate it. We talked about how um, the requests need to roughly look like, right? So post needs to have a body, for example. Others can have a body, other methods, but this body is, you know, whatever the resource that should be added to the server at a given endpoint and so on. Um, that's right. So, but what else do we need, of course, um, in order to do that? How do we store information? Uh, database. Database, cool. Which one do we use? Is there only one? With, what, what, would you, what would you use intuitively? What kind of database? For example, yep, cool. Um, how far are you in the database course right now? Uh, just starting PHP. Oh, on the, the database, which one are you using? Uh, we, uh, MySQL, okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so MySQL relation database. What other databases exist there as well? So, what did you did you hear, learn anything about those and use them before? Uh, Open question, to everyone. Uh, yeah, I didn't get that. Uh, only in, like we haven't had like practical experience with uh, just just talking about it. Hmm? Yeah, just talking. About it. Cool. Let's continue to talk. Perfect. Um, so um, one one database. It's also for the category. We go a bit into theory behind it and so on, but very briefly. Uh, and um, for this course, um, after some deliberation, 
Many of you will be acquainted with the uh, database called MongoDB, for example, have heard that as the, the database, uh, entry level database for you know, SQL uh, examples, you know, collection storage and so on. And uh, it's not the only one, because unlike, um, or uh, in, in, in the relational world, I think there's some uh, selection of best practices and dialects have kind of dominated the market, right? So either, for example, you're comfortable with Oracle's database, right, or you are uh, MySQL or MariaDB uh, uh, afflicted, so meaning you, you speak SQL of that style, so they're different dialects, right? And similarly, in the, uh, slightly worse, in fact, in the, um, in, in the no SQL sphere, there's also a lot of little, pro a lot of products that pop up and, you know, some make it into market and become to some extent de facto standards, but some principles uh, remain the same. And uh, there is MongoDB and it can be nicely used as relational databases as well with uh, Go in the backend. So you could have your Go service and you know MySQL behind it or MongoDB or whatever else. So they all do their job. That's not the problem. Um, the challenge here or the, um, the reason for going with Firebase, I'll get to that in a second, is twofold, namely that the Mongo driver mm. or the interaction of the Mongo driver with uh, Golang is sometimes tedious because there are multiple competing ones. And some work well, some not so well with certain solutions because it depends on the version of Mongo that you're running. So it's a lot of pain and agony. So the idea here was, uh, okay, let's let's do less of that uh, pain and use something or try to integrate something that's on the one hand no SQL, on the other hand, uh, also quite compatible with Golang. And that is indeed Firebase. Has anyone heard about Firebase before? Cool. Who creates Firebase? Who is owner of Firebase? Okay, let's let's guess further. You guys, next table. Who owns it? Just, there's no right and wrong here. Well, there's a wrong, but you don't get penalties for it. Put it this way. I see something blinking. What? Google. Google. Okay, then someone used uh, Google to find out that it's Google. anyway. Uh, I shouldn't go down that rabbit hole. But no, it's Google indeed. Yes, uh, Google is owning this. So no surprise, it works quite well with GoLang because GoLang is made by. Ah, Google. Ah, nearly forgot that one. In worst case, use Google to figure out who created Golang and Firebase. So uh, it's all Google owned. So that, um, I want to be explicit about it because it is, of course, a bit of, bit of a lock in effect, right? We're de facto committed to one, uh, one uh, vendor, but still to raise awareness. I mean, uh, uh, Golang itself is still open source and so on. Uh, and Cloud, uh, sorry, Firebase is only one of the many solutions to have, but one of the conveniences is all of you have an account there. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in Google, uh, likely, and therefore you have access to Firebase in, with its basic features as well. And the integration is actually quite neat and nice, but also it offers you a lot of opportunities for further development of cloud services. Because in the third part, or in the, uh, for the project of, um, that's embedded as part of this course, uh, you are tasked with kind of forming groups and forming own ideas, right? And exploring, develop your own service as part of the project. And um, that's why I'm pointing you later to Firebase as a platform for doing so, because it has a lot of richer facilities and functionalities that you can use on, you know, uh, on top of just you know, writing services. So they, for example, by, uh, have analytics, machine learning functionalities and so on. So quite nice to know about, I guess, uh, hence Firebase. Okay, so, right. So, uh, of course, the motivation underlying is that we only have mem in memory storage for now. So if we lose everything that we have right now, um, you know, if we switch off a service, for example, in Roku, bad luck, data is gone. Not too good, right? So for storing, it's not a good idea. It would work temporarily, right? While you're running, you can send a post request, keep it in memory. But point is, if that exceeds a certain, you know, uh, um, your, your RAM, name it, um, or whatever else, then you're suddenly in trouble, you reach starting your service, and boom, all your information is gone. So persistence is a thing, and we need to bother with this. And plus also, you're somewhat liable if you actually provide an API, you better want to save the information you're receiving and not just hope that you don't have a power outage like uh, uh, we are experiencing elsewhere in the world right now, for example. Anyway, so you know about relational databases. What are the advantages and what disadvantages do we have? That should be quick if you have talked about no SQL databases, because that's the very reason. Is, uh, it's not very well structured, but that's also a disadvantage, I guess. Are you talking about uh, relational databases or? Oh, wait, that's, that's not a It's up to you. You could phrase it either way around. They're, yeah. op they're basically just inverted, the yeah, opposite. Advantages, it's like it's very structured. Mm -hmm. So, like, you have like table formats, mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. Uh, disadvantages, I guess, like it can kind of get. Uh, 
um, I get out of hand, like, uh, everything, um, out of hand. Yeah. So you had you were exposed to your first uh, join query, was it? Huh? In our outer join, and then suddenly things get got out of hand. I don't know. Had anyone that experience? Yeah. Well, I guess what that's the same noise girl. But um, but uh, yeah, that I mean, it becomes increasingly complex, right? But, but yeah, it's, it's hard to add in like a like a new column, for example. You know, like yeah. Have uh, unknown types. Yeah. Yeah, so th that's the key thing you're getting at, right? So SQL or the, the one of the key advantages that is, of course, well structured. You set the relations. You know, it's always in tabular form. You think about it as tables, and so on. One of the advantages is, of course, very structured. It's consistent as well, right? So it's one of the key things that's about relational databases. But it's uh, static as well, right? In a sense, in terms of its structure, not in content, of course. But if you change the schema, that's really quite expensive usually, right? Because it carries through your entire code base, right? You need to review whether, you know, you need to adjust fields, how they're represented and so on. So it's always a very direct relationship that can be to some extent uh, painful. Yeah, so advantages um, and disadvantages, right? So, I mean, one of the advantages is of course the reliability as well. They have been well tested, right? Um, over years, so 19, what is it? 60s, 70s, I think, uh, since when we have relational databases. So that's, that's a good, Trade to some extent, and a lot of information nowadays is, of course, stored in relational databases, especially in stable systems, right? So this lack of flexibility can also be a strength in the sense that uh, you know you can guarantee consistency, right? If there's a miss, uh, entry missing, for example, in a, in a tuple, right, your system can, by system design, pick up on it, especially if there's different end, uh, uh, you know, um, user-facing applications using the same database in the backend. The database itself can capture those issues, as opposed to requiring all those, you know, uh, um, um, UIs or um, front-end applications to kind of catch this in the first place, right? So there is this uh, reliability feature that is strong, and um, I mean, one thing that's particularly hailed is like transaction safety. Anyone? What was that? Now the pain. Right? So again, I just. Yeah, that, that's the risk side. That's that we get back to that. That's beautiful. Again, that risk thing applies to NoSQL to some extent as well. Um, but what I want to get at is um, transaction safety is a is a concept you're talking. About. I've certainly talked about in databases or heartbeat. Okay. Are you multiple instances? Okay. Um, I think Hardwick is relevant if you have two instances, if you are um, uh, replicating basically your databases and you want to keep them in sync, then they use Hardbeats to ensure that, there's, uh, that they are up to date and linked. Yeah. And I want to get it's like, like um, there, there is a, an acronym that characterizes um, the principles of point is transaction safety, just to motivate this briefly. If you add something to the database, sometimes, especially if it's complex, let's say it's a New student added to NTNU, right? The student, hang on, needs to be added. Student has an address. Student has linked to a particular program, has linkage to particular courses, right? And this is more generally more than one query, or often more than one query in a database, right? But the, one of the principles that um, um, relational systems um, always require is that this either works, either works or doesn't work reliably. Either it works and the full student is registered better in the system, but not like 50% of a student. There's a student in the system. It's not linked to course. We don't have the address, but there's a student. That's the worst possible outcome from a, from a, from a consistency point of view, right? You better have a controlled failure and can deal with this or not. So that's the idea of transaction safety. Even if you have multiple interlinked interactions with the database, they either work as one or they don't work at all. Did you talk about those things yet? What was the acronym associated? What characteristics? Do you have associated with transactions? Because they apply to noise as well. Or oh, call him. No. Anyone? Acid, anyone? Okay, good. Promise is all in databases. Um, but, but the idea is basically that you have an atomic uh, activity. So either you know either it works or it doesn't work, right? So C stands for testing, you guys. Yeah, okay, there you go. Okay, please, please enlighten us, Jason. 
Consistency, yeah, consistency, yeah, that's really good, right? Consistency, right? So you retain the same structure, structural integrity of the data is retained. Yeah. Uh, the next one, I. Uh, isolation. Yeah. What's that about? Okay. Isolation is about if you have two requests, right? You know, you're adding every semester, we add more than one student, I promise you, right? At least two or five or 200 or 1,000, who knows? And likely, some of those are added at the same time. The idea is that one query doesn't affect any other, right? We're adding student number one and student number two. It may well be that the addition of student number two fails, but it should not affect the addition of student number one. Whether or not it fails, doesn't matter. Isolation. So because they're independent entity. Good, and the other one, the D? Durability. Cool, durability meaning it survives a power outage. So once it's stored and it's kind of in the database, it shouldn't matter, we could switch it off on again, we have the same stuff again. The asset properties, you will learn about them more, I guess, anyway, uh, but I just want to bring them up because they're relevant in our case as well. They're one of the key characteristics for persistence as we expected. So, okay, no SQL databases. So uh, one of the key words that people often use is that they're schema-less, they don't have schema, right? What does it mean? There's no like overall structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like there aren't boundaries, I guess, and like structural boundaries. Like you can just make new yeah. types anytime you want. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so I just repeat for the street. So, Jason said that there are no structural boundaries. So, there are, they, they suggest unlimited change, I guess, a talk change or something. So it's, yeah, so there are, of course, it's to some extent boundaries <laughs> to, to what you can do, right? So core concepts, but you're right, right? So the key idea is that if you have a new concept, such as a student, and you're adding a student ID or adding address or whatever, that should be a very painless process of adding this, as opposed to thinking about MySQL or whatever, or MariaDB for that matter, we add a different column, affect all other students, and, you know, you want to ensure consistency again. Of course, desirable, particularly in the university context, but in some instances, not that relevant. Uh, you don't care about the all instances, you only care on from now onwards, please, let's do it this way, right? So that, that may be sometimes permissible in, in uh, uh, information systems, especially if they're not like by banks or other forms of those institutions that uh, have strong requirements to auditability, I guess, of the activity. Um, cool. So um, other advantages or other perhaps they, they play towards the disadvantage of the um, relational databases. Yeah, so you can put in your data without uh, rigid constraints, is that what you write? Yeah, you can put in your data a lot without rigid constraints. Without rigid constraints, yes. So it's more flexibility on the data that you put, uh, it, you, 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 you add to the database, good and bad at the same time, because the database can't really validate it, but just bluntly saves whatever you send it. So the responsibilities on the client side. Well, one of the arguments that's often put forward is um, relational databases as a critique in particular. Um, they're focused so much focus on the representation of data that they don't think about performance. Right? It's always centered around, centered around the data, the decomposition, how they should be separated and so on. But no one really thinks about how to effectively retrieve this whole complex you know, set of information uh, again afterwards. And um, there are some alleviations mechanisms you probably learn about indices eventually or have heard about it already, like primary keys are usually default indices in relational databases, but you can also manually set them to kind of see, ah, yeah, nah, this common is very important, the column, sorry, is very important, should be retrieved rather quickly, so therefore I'm uh, indexing this as well. Um, but the idea in the NoSQL database is really centered around the, the data, the way you need it as part of your program, right? So it's not, the idea is not to have a generic way of, um, dealing with data, but a, a flexible way that kind of is, um, responds to uh, how you need it in your application, particular focus on performance. That's very abstract here, that's like super stylized, but if you want to compare it basically, whereas in a relational database, a relational model, you have a very rigidly defined organization, right? Tables, subtables, uh, you know, one-to-n relationships, end-to-end relationships that are resolved by uh, secondary tables and all that kind of, you know, so, and, and then secondary keys and so on. So, and that's the idea that overall you have a, a consistency in the data model that is, you know, and you can navigate from all entities to the uh, other ones where the relationships that exist between tables, those can be further enforced on uh, any modification of entries and so on. No SQL databases follow uh, what's called the data 
a document data model principle. The idea is there, yes, we still have collections of things, students, universities, buildings, rooms, you know, appointments. But the structure they're in, this can, uh, can be diverse potentially, right? So you can multiple documents, but they can have similar or different internal structure, right? So, and you see already, okay, that now that's getting closer to the idea uh, of uh, schema lessness. So you still have boundaries in the sense that, yes, we're using the concept of a document or collection, as we'll see in a bit, but within we have this flexibility of saying, hey, from tomorrow onwards, students have this property toothbrush color, right? Because it's super important for the administration. Um, I don't know. So that, that's the idea, right? So but it shouldn't necessarily affect the entire data model, but only subsequent additions. And when you retrieve it, well, you guess what? You only get the students that have that property if you're querying it, right? Bad luck um, or good luck, depending. So the, what's the other obvious advantage when you think about yourself as a cloud service developer? Or well, as a developer more generally? Yeah, what does it mean for you in practice as a developer? Well, uh, you said legacy, right? So dealing with legacy systems becomes cheaper and easier in a way. Yeah, but it's super for prototyping, right? For developing. You just, you know, change your data schema on the fly. When it's eventually stable, you stick to it. And if you think that needs to be rock solid, yeah, well, you make it relational afterwards, right? But especially in the development process, you always, you don't always need to think about uh, you know, how it's represented in the code and then corresponding change to data model, because even in your little PHP experience, you probably feel the pain already. Every time you do a change on the front end, you also need to think about a change in the back end, right? Your data model needs to correspond to it, right? Which, which may be okay for smaller, for smaller instances, but it becomes really, really complex when we're dealing with larger uh, documents or are still in the process of coming up with a data structure. That's the cool bit. So the flexibility there uh, that exists. At an expense, of course, it can't be guaranteed. And that's the key idea. So anyway, so no scale data. I just want to um, briefly motivate this a bit more. So it's really like the flexibility and the ad hoc nature of kind of creating um, entries, particularly in documents uh, themselves, uh, necessarily easy migration, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, form follows performance, right? You optimize against the fields you need, not how they are, are you know, idiomatically represented in a relational database by, you know, following the normalization step, identifying them as first order entities or dependencies, having identifying functional dependencies and so on. You don't care. It could even be duplica uh, duplication in those documents as long as they're quickly readable, right? Again, that uh, there's pain and there's challenges like validation. You know, how do you ensure if you have redundant data entries that they're actually consistent on you, right? So uh, not, not provided. And there's no standardization per se. I mean, SQL, of course, has also different dialects, but nevertheless, they are to a considerable extent standardized uh, for, for reliability purposes. But again, we need to also bear in mind, we have a tech difference of 30 years, whereas um, relational databases came up in the 70s, I believe, that were popularized. Um, we're dealing with no SQL databases only beginning of 2000, so at best 20 years, 50 and odd years, until they have found broader uh, attention. So it's quite quite relevant. What type of NoSQL databases there are? Are there? So it's not only one, because that's the obvious point. If you have SQL databases, guess what? You think about relational databases, right? Of course, right? Always tables, relationships, sorted and done, plus some, some bells and whistles. In the NoSQL world, by the very definition of having a schema-less structure, the databases themselves can also be very different in their, uh, in their approach. And the original ones were actually super simple ones. The idea is just we have a key value store, right? It's beautiful, a map basically, right? You have a key and then values attached to it. Can be one or more value, who knows, right? Sometimes a bit unstructured, a bit, bit, bit uh, a wide value store. That basically means you have one key and n values associated with this or one-to-one -one relationship, one key, one value, and so on. You can have tuples, you have kind of objects, perhaps you not storing text in there, but actually images, videos, whatever else, right? So also quite straightforward. So very primitive one. Then the next step then was the kind of uh, document uh, structure idea. So the idea that if you think about document, uh, even though we've treated it as unstructured or semi-structured in many instances, it has a certain um, structure embedded. If you think about, even about a text, you have a title, probably an author, you have a section header, uh, you have paragraph headers, you have paragraphs themselves and so on. So there's an element of structure in there, right? And it's generally not following the key value layout, but more like a tree structure, right? So you have a document that has n sections, they have n subsections, and they have n paragraphs or whatever else, right? So, and this is kind of a concession here um, that um, the, the structures that you represent are slightly more complex than just key value pairs. 
or of course you can embed many things in key value pairs, but you have nested or embedded uh, uh, structures and they're best represented in document forms in the first place um, as well. And the last bit is um, something that's more, more recent, like uh, graph databases, where it's really about not so much telling, uh, talking about documents anymore, but treating data as nodes and links. Right? So we have actually entity students, how they relate to universities, how they relate to addresses, and how, you know, so they, they're kind of changing around the picture a bit and focusing on um, the, 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 the graph structure, more complex graph structure that emerges between entities. It has different purposes. Values and data is, of course, held within the entities or um, um, in, within the nodes, uh, but it emphasizes the navigation across vertices uh, rather than um, having a, a focus on um, one consistent data structure. So key value store, you can imagine, I don't think you have to motivate this uh, quite straightforward, right? That's the idea. But again, you have this issue, if you have structure, for example, embedded, such as shown here, probably need to point the camera to myself because I'm jumping around here. Uh, if you have embedded structure, for example, such as shown here, you know, you have, um, let's say, regular um, characters or strings, numbers and then suddenly dates and so on that's something you need to deal with you need to disambiguate it. it's like a nightmare right so it's not really a beautiful way of dealing with this but if you had document database it becomes a lot better already right so you have kind of you know different documents and yes they can vary slightly in structure but you can still have some sort of uniformity embedded there right for example document ids well you know at least i can retrieve them by ids that's pretty cool already in fact that's a feature that all those databases have uh, anyway but if you see variation here so for example in one instance uh, the name is called you know let's say uh, simply name as key um and here it's kind of a full name and here's it decomposed in first and last and so on so you have this structure variability you need to deal with it somehow and use it perhaps you're only interested in this structure meaning you only get documents that embed this kind of structural layout for names first name last name for example but um, you have this flexibility in a way, but you never let's see that embedded in the document structure is generally this key value idea, right? So think about JSON, then you're pretty much there, right? So, um, and in fact, that's one of the standard formats that's actually used for those document uh, databases. There's no requirement to use JSON. Uh, I just don't want to see the misconception. There's always JSON in there. It's often, but it could also just be values, just text. If you wanted to, it can also be XML, it can be YAML, whatever uh, other kind of, um, um, you know, um, representation uh, standard you want to use. In fact, we talk about YAML at a uh, later stage anyway. So you'll learn at least one more. Okay, so that's document databases. They embed some of the advantages of key value, but wrap documents around it effectively or, and collections in there, right? So there could be a, there's no collection here, but it could be an embedded um, collection as well. Graph databases, again, as I mentioned before, the idea is really, it's about linking um, um, different nodes systematically for navigation. So the idea is that you can uh, flexibly navigate a particular graph. Um, so that's uh, quite interesting. I, I just came across that one. Basically, someone tried to map relationships between entities and concepts and challenges, topics, and whatever in the Bible, actually, to try to trace back who makes reference to uh, adultery, for example, right, or to Matthew, whatever, it doesn't matter. So, but the idea is basically that you organize the data really about navigational links. Uh, anyway, um, we're not talking about the letter, but there's a lot of space in all this area, right? So, um, we have document databases, so it's MongoDB, uh, white column stores, white column stores, they have much more, more on the um, representation um, in addition to the key, so many columns, not just the key value, but the value is further decomposed. Um, good for information retrieval, especially a lot of information and uh, very quickly accessible. Um, then there's the classic key value databases. In fact, many instances overlaps by the vendors. They just have different kind of takes on the same thing. Uh, and then we have the graph databases there as well. So some, some overview. And we are playing this area mostly. That's the um, document database um, realm. Okay. So document databases, what's the general principles? The idea is that we're dealing with collections of documents, right? So, um, and uh, the idea is that we um, give those, those, those documents unique identifiers that allow their access, modification, reading, CRUD operations effectively. Um, and um, the, the content is flexible, but you know, you as a developer need to decide on the content. And I would say uh, go with the key value structure internally, right? So it kind of makes sense. You write JSON, you read JSON, could also be plain text, 
it's up to you, but something that's alongside that structure, because that is the kind of understanding of documents that we have a structure, a graph structure embedded in there. Um, and then um, generally all those uh, no-scale databases furthermore allow for systematic ways of um, retrieving the entire collection, parts of it, um, change, um, um, you know, elements of documents or, you know, uh, create them, of course, as well. So general CRUD operation, but also within documents um, to some extent. Anyway, so that's the kind of the general layout just to give you a feel of how to think about it. So if you had, for example, uh, um, you know, a collection called restaurants, which consists of multiple documents, documents contain less instances of restaurants, of course, one to three. And those actually then may themselves have reviews, right? Restaurant one may have, may have reviews, restaurant two, blah, 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 blah. And instead of unifying this, like in a relational model where we put all the reviews in one table and all restaurants in one in another table, here it's really organized about uh, around the entities, what they, you know, the excess of the entities effectively, right? You could well make the call and say, hey, those need to be integrated in one collection, all the reviews as possible. So you can remodel the relational schema, but the benefit lies here that you don't have to, because it may just well be faster if you're in your web application only ever interested in retrieving reviews specific for a place. That's the common use, right? It's not like you come to your and say, I want to reviews of all restaurants, but it's oftentimes, hey, I'm, I walk by this particular restaurant, can't say names right now, um, but uh, give me all the reviews, right? That, that, that may be a much more relevant use case, for, like, for example, for context service sensitive application, context aware applications. So then that structure would be superior to one that is kind of, you know, provides you all the reviews in the first place to all restaurants in your big or elsewhere, right? So if that was the case, remodel, right? So here's the idea that you, you can put away, don't, don't put it away, but you can bench your relational thinking for a second when you think about no SQL and think about it pragmatically. How is it relevant for my application, for my use case? And don't have this disconnected thinking between the application use and the proper data model because there's usually very few answers to relational data models right there are, there are variations of course in, uh, in how you can model things but it's far less compared to this one here where you can really organize it around different concepts i hope that makes somewhat intuitive sense right you have a certain flexibility um all right cool so just before I let you go, so uh, we, yeah, we turn closer to this one, but just to motivate this for a second here, in, 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 when we think about um, no SQL databases, you have something like a collection on the left side. Collection contains one or more documents with unique identifier. Documents contain whatever schematic structure embedded is here, right? So here we assume a key value structure with some sort of nesting representation, but that's the extent to what you have, right? You can actually also embed collections in the document as well. So you can spread out. You can say, hey, this document, uh, the, the, this document, uh, for example, the, the document here is looks at different um, um, businesses in Jovic, right? So we have plumbing businesses, we have uh, wood you know, processing facilities, Jovic, you have uh, uh, chemical um, um, operations and organizations on. And they themselves have kind of different sub collections that focuses, oh, that's company number one. And that's their reviews, right? You can uh, basically the hierarchical substructure can be arbitrarily expanded further, right? You could, for example, organize it by uh, by, by industry type if you wanted to, right? So so it's not just three levels, and there you are, but actually you can have collections under those ones as well, right? So you can branch out further and have a more complex hierarchical tree to represent um, this information. Anyway, I give you a break. Quarter past. Thanks for your attention so far. So we're back on track, um, or are we? Let's see. Now I'm seeking the attention by the present students. We'll see how it goes. Yep, I think I'm 100% nearly. Um, okay, let's talk a bit more about uh, getting closer to what we want to get uh, at, and that's of course Firebase, because I just want to show you a bit how it's uh, possibly used, and also from with Go, but all, from within Go. But first, I want to motivate higher Firebase more generally what it is because that's actually more like a collection of services as opposed to the distinct services, we'll see. Um, anywho, so where was I? Well, previously, um, I just motivated the idea of having, where's my mouse thing, there you go. It died, I guess. Ah, it's back. All right, previously I just motivated that we have the hierarchical structure, right, between that can be uh, accommodating your needs as opposed to 
uh, you know, like a relational uh, database structure, if you like. And that's the rough structure. So we have a collection, collection has documents, documents have document structure content, yeah, key value pairs with nested structures as well. So that's the idea um, there. Okay, so with this background in mind for now, which is quite simple and straightforward, because it's nearly is, um, let's look at Firebase, because that's one example of a, a document-based um, um, database, and there in specifically Cloud Firestore. So I didn't make up those names, but I just repeat them, so don't blame me for it. But so the whole bigger ecosystem or the kind of a service that is surrounded is actually a past service. Um, it's called uh, Firebase, offered by Google, and therein there's a set of subservices, and one of them is this Firestore business. And that's really, really quite rich. It offers, you know, like um, one of the pains when you develop an application is that you need to think about, you know, you need to implement what has been implemented five times before authentication. Right? So, how do you want to authenticate? Yay, most modern websites use your Facebook account. We make it super easy, convenient for you and very convenient for Facebook. Um, so, or do you have your individual, you know, um, username, password, credentials, saving mechanisms, do your own database structure, all that pain. Firebase can kind of do that for you to some extent, or at least it offers an API to do it. Then it's of course the NoSQL database, Firestore as it's called. There's another real-time database storage, machine learning, and so on capabilities. But I think to motivate this best, um, let's just look at um, this thing. I'll bring up this. The video panel is my enemy, I think. Well, let's see. Right. So, Firebase. Oh, ah, yeah, let's look at the pricing, of course, the most important bit. Um, here's the thing, you can start for free, so that's the good news. So that's, that's Firebase. If you just type firebase.google.com, you will arrive there, basically. And, uh, you know, it, has a, it already shows you the set of features. It has authentication features, A-B testing, so you can do, you know, um, uh, significance tests, basically, uh, on data you have, perhaps from experiments. Otherwise, analytics, uh, you can look at app distribution. I are looking at that, um, of course, Firebase is one generic path service uh, offered by Google. And that's not only for cloud services per se, uh, or cloud applications in the widest sense, but also for apps, mobile apps. So it's, you can also use it as backend for Android, for example. Uh, if, you, if you're taking a mobile course, that's a very attractive um, opportunity as well. And the support is all there, I'll show you in a second. Then there's you know, Cloud Firestore, Cloud Functions, we talk about those ones, messaging, hosting. Um, and so on, a lot of different stuff. Let's go to the console. Perhaps that gives us a more authoritative overview of what's in there. So let's see, here's the console. All right, and I uh, went in there um, already. Let me just create a project, whatever. Good. It assigns the identifier inside that creates that thing. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Google Analytics, not today. So, um, next bit. And then you basically have access to the full feature set. So, and it will some of you, because it's a pass, yet another pass solution that you know now remind you actually of Heroku in many respects. But the features that we're using is quite a bit different, are quite a bit different. And the features are, of course, a bit different in the first place. But let's just go into one of those. Project. So that's how it starts, how it looks like when you start it. Everyone who has a Google account should be able to just log in immediately using a Google account. I don't think it's any value making your life harder by setting up a different separate one. You can just use it uh, out of the box. So they, of course, they have a, many, a lot of advertising, but what you want to look, uh, look at is the left side here, right? So you have authentication as a feature, which is kind of neat. Uh, and just to motivate this a bit, because I, that's something I uh, kind of kind of like, but it's of course, um, again, a strong buy-in. Here's the thing, what it offers. So you want to model authentication and by default, it offers, you know, uh, APIs for uh, different forms of authentication. Either, either you can do your email password thing with confirmation email business, right? If you want to do this one, you can just hook into their API for this purpose. Why a phone, why a Google, why a play, why a Facebook, why a Twitter, GitHub, Yahoo. So you see already that would be really a pain uh, to do it manually, so you can have kind of offload it to those guys and just deal with their API for that purpose. One thing I'm missing is FIDA in there, but I don't think that will ever make it in there. Uh, it would be nice as well, having my interview students 
managed here. Um, but bear in mind, of course, it's still a Google service, so GDPR and so on. Uh, that said, they actually allow you when you create a, a project to specify where it lies at least. And the free version, you have access to a data center in US and one in Europe. Strongly recommend to take the European one if you want to claim some sort of GDPR compliance. You guys are comfortable with GDPR, what that is when I say this? Okay, I only see 50% of heads nodding. That means I need to have a session on this one. It's about data privacy. We need to talk about this anyway when you deal with other people's data which uh, will be an issue later on. Anyway, so I don't want to make too much advertising here. I just want to say that, you know, you have different login options. You can monitor even the usage. It's pretty cool. Like it has really rich uh, analytics functionality. You can, of course, adjust this to your own uh, domain, uh, configure email verification and so on. There you have it. So it's very rich in uh, functionality. You can, uh, um, you know, automate SMS verification, for example. So that's one of the features. So one of the very strong ones. Then there's Cloud Firestore. I'll turn to that in a second. So um, that is just um, the database. Let's go into that later. Then we have the real time database, which is kind of cool because it allows you to. Ah, there you go. It, now it asks me to um, decide where my data center lies as soon as you create a database. And I'm going for uh, Belgium and Europe, of course, um, for example. So I don't think we'll, uh, there's much per se to see, but um, this real-time database is kind of nice if you want to um, 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 have notification of users. So you have uh, basically a uh, publish subscribe scheme where you offer a user URL, tell them to subscribe to this using yeah, generally the Android app. And then every time you send a notification, it's sent to them uh, um, the uh, end devices quite quickly, but also retained in this database. So that's the primary purpose of that one. We have a fixed endpoint and then basically can have uh, different um, uh, uh, real time settings um, that you uh, both in terms of notifications, but also interaction uh, that you can facilitate. We're not using this one. The other one is uh, a storage. Um, so it allows you to actually store stuff on your I think I have a ready-made project. It will be faster other than me going back into. Um, let me just scroll back because then it's all set up. Um, or you see it at least. Patience. Ah, there you go. One click. So, um, where was I? I want to throw storage. That's right. So we don't see that pain again. Here you can basically uh, upload files and make them available, like uh, you know, at a given at a given endpoint, right? So the idea is basically there to just have um, you know the Proc 2005 demo appspot.com. Appspot is the kind of Google-owned uh, um, um, kind of domain, and then uh, a file sitting behind it. You can offer this. You can host your own domains, so you can link your own domains to it. Uh, you can also have um, cloud functions. What are cloud functions? Can't we'll use it anyway? I'll need to pay. But the idea is basically isolation of. We we'll talk about it a bit more later on when we talk about AWS Lambda. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, isolating business logic and just providing functions with endpoints. And you know, you want to, for example, think about um, uh, uh, credit worthiness as an application. You don't want to provide a new UI or something like this. You just want to provide the functionality to tell me, okay, that person's credit worthy or not in the bank's case. And then you allow banks to use it and they can put their own UIs in front of it or whatever else. That's what Cloud Functions is about, right? So it's instantiations of very specific, very fine-grained uh, uh, functionality. We'll talk about this again a bit more. So the last bit is, of course, machine learning, um, where um, the uh, Firebase shines, text recognition is built in, image labeling, face detection, language identification, for example, uh, possible automated replies on phones. You can try that on your partner, see how that goes. Um, tried it once, it wasn't a good experience. Um, so, and, um, so in addition to those uh, functionality features, right, the, the, the main, the main um, functionality provider of the box, um, for, for building and hosting, there's the analytics side, which is also really, really powerful. Um, so you can, you can have a dashboard, for example, to see how your applications fare, uh, download rates, where they sit, the audiences, you know, and so on. And um, messaging functionalities that, ah, this is actually the messaging functionality I meant. Um, yeah, various forms of uh, messaging, having the uh, creation of dynamic links and so on. 
uh, predictions, so the whole ML kind of uh, game. I would encourage you not necessarily to use that all now, but to bear that in mind. Hey, guys. Um, to bear that in mind when you get towards your actual project, uh, when you um, uh, uh, want additional facilities or we want to achieve machine learning or try out something, you know, something different or messaging between the endpoint devices or whatever else, or uh, rely on hosted data somewhere and so on. So use it. A lot of, a lot of it is free, but if, it, if you hit kind of a paywall and you know it wasn't, um, so, um, but it's worthwhile exploring it. So one of them is Cloud Firestore. And that's the one that we're actually interested in. You get it for free, of course, with part uh, of, of Firebase. And the first thing you need to do to make it uh, slightly painful is to um, find a way of authenticating and uh, using it, of course. So, and how that is done in practice is that you go into the project settings and you create what's so-called a um, service account. And it's kind of neat um, in a sense that it actually allows you to even give you the code snippets to authenticate or to use it in your in your application. So in this case, of course, go support here, no surprise. Uh, I think we expected all that one. And then you create a unique private key that's linked to your particular application, right? But as a service account, so you don't have username and password. It's basically just a private key that uh, you uh, authenticates you against this service that you download. I did, uh, did it already. I can show you an example in a bit. Um, and basically just use that snippet of code effectively in order to, um, you know, link yourself to this Firebase instance, right? So it's uh, quite straightforward. It literally requires the modification of the path to the file and then creating a so-called new app, basically, that you can reference and, um, uh, you know, work on, do things on. And we get back to that in a second. Okay. Um, So I, of course, provide the resources. You can uh, use those later. But even uh, I myself also need just want to open some of the links here that are provided to provide you with a bit more context. And uh, this is UL basically to um, a kind of a, a neat, nice intro on how to uh, create things. Basically, it's nice. You can really switch uh, also switch between the different um, programming languages you want to use. If you're using, for example, uh, Android, uh, you can uh, decide between Kotlin and Java, for example, or uh, Swift support, Objective C support is there. So it's really a cross platform activity that you can do um, there. So that's like uh, initialize the server and all that kind of business. You saw that just now. The only thing you need to have here is the private key uh, credentials file that you download. Um, and then you're already in the, in the interaction space where it basically uh, shows you how to interact with the database. And I'll exemplify this in a bit. So generally, you instantiate a client first, that guy here. So, um, so it creates a new app from the context. And, in, and uh, from within the app, so that's an app's instance of Firebase, you get the Firestore um, I mean, database only, and that's your client you interact with. And on that one, you actually call things like client.collection, right? And then add, for example. So here, this one calls the, the Firestore client calls the um, function collection, which references a collection users, and then adds from the given context this payload to the server, for example, right? So, and again, you assess as to whether that went successful or not. So that's how basically how it, how it works uh, in uh, practice. So quite straightforward, there's various instances. How do you read data? Quite similar, client to uh, collections documents, for example, retrieves all documents, and you can iterate over those documents and um, print them out possibly. So this the iterator in Go, so iter.net next. And then either you have an arrow and put a potential reference to a document. If you want to show a document, you just call the data function on the document. So that's the kind of a very primitive way of getting started. And I just want to motivate this uh, before I show you a bit of um, um, code in this context. Because the idea is now, can we simply and sensibly use this to kind of um, store data and how I want to show you how easy it is as well. So here's a bit of a prepared um, project. Uh, we can adapt this a bit further if time permits, but also I'll upload it so you can use it for your own reference and play with this. Um, let's start where all things start. This is the main function. So again, here's the, um, you, you instantiate the context that you need to um, use. That's part of the Google Colling library. 
as well you um, I didn't um, link the credentials file. Uh, I just called it service uh, JSON, uh, sorry, service account JSON. And it lies, in fact, in my main directory here, as you can see, in my uh, GoLand project, for example. So that's the um, user directory for the project. Um, and then I create a new instance, um, exactly what I showed you just before. Good. And then we do the usual thing. We make it Heroku compliant, of course, if we want to, so we can host it in Heroku. And then uh, it's about linking endpoints, or handlers, rather. Uh, two different uh, endpoints. By the way, here, that's my concession to forgivingness uh, by allowing both the endpoints with slash and without, because people forget it all the time, myself included, and then hand off the handling elsewhere. So, okay, let's look at the handler. So, usual handler, no magic there, hang on. So, post and get, and both of them are basically redirected to respective methods. Let's move to the post one first. Uh, and that's called add message. So as long as we keep the structure of the response writer and request um, handler or request um, pointer consistent, then it's quite uh, straightforward. This one is really blunt. It reads the entire content using UITL, IU, util, read all, again, which is uh, to be taken with care because if it's large payload, it can be a bit challenging, but nevertheless, it just takes the entire text, extracts it into a variable, um, and um, adds it to the database. So here I'm doing a bit of testing. If the text is zero, I just, uh, you know, not do anything, but actually um, tell the client that they should provide some sort of payload and then send them a 400 as a response. But if things go um, right, meaning that there's payload, I just call client collection messages and uh, encapsulate um, this text in, in, in some sort of JSON, primitive JSON structure, right? So here, um, text, and then it's basically a string version of that very text. And I add it to the collection using this particular command and uh, deal possibly with errors, right? That's basically it. So quite straightforward and everything went well. If there's an error, of course, uh, I point to the error. If everything went well, I just suggest that everything went fine. So that's the, that's the uh, create handler. The display handler is even easier. Client collection documents, get everything instantiate and iterate uh, so the, the iterator is here instantiated so it makes reference to all the documents that sit in the collection collection and then uh, i'm iterating through uh, um, those and basically um, checking for the iterator flag done so if the iterator says it's done that's over so basically you can break um, the loop from there and if there's no error then we have all the reason to think that things went successful to access the data we just say uh, document reference data basically this is the content of the data you see you can access a lot of other things like the update time create time read time uh, check whether it exists merely perhaps you're just interested if something exists as opposed to reading its content that's something you can do as well and then i'll print it back using uh, our usual um, f write um, or f print uh, feature writing it back to the response writer basically the message as is so let's look at this thing and let's see how this thing looks in in, in real life, if it starts, that is, it does. Okay, so now we of course need to have an endpoint. It's listening on eighty eighty. It's my local machine. I'm using my uh, test tool here. Hang on, it's always Postman just to motivate what I'm doing. I'm pointing to the endpoint 8080 messages, right? That's how I call it. And basically, if you uh, send something with a GET request, there's nothing there to be to be seen or to be had, right? So now I want to send a POST request, and I just put blunt text content in there. Recall that this uh, crude example takes care of kind of wrapping this into a JSON format. Uh, but you could, of course, expect this from a client as well. But I want to make it simple here. So just sending a POST with some payload to this endpoint. Let's see if we get a. 201 created, that looks good, entry edit. So let's look at the database, how that looks like uh, in there. Zoom is fighting me. I'm not sure it's winning, but it's not me. So let's see. Um, So there you go. So uh, suddenly there's something in there. Um, the, I'm not sure if you saw it earlier, but the collection was actually empty. And just by referencing collection, it creates a collection that doesn't exist. It's also nice. So yeah, super ad hoc, because it, I didn't need to do anything on the database, right? So it created it for me as long as I adhere to the structure. So collections 
I said something at a document and uh, here's the content you may recognize this from my um, you know postman call basically quite quite straightforward the same payload here and um, what it basically just does it wraps it into a document and provides it with a unique identifier right which is provided here not the most accessible one but that's the point anyway right because you want a unique identifier that's not guessable um okay so basically that's that's the idea and on the client side if you then want to use it it's uh, equally straightforward to simply uh let's see it actually is straightforward to just retrieve it yeah so basically printing just the map content and you'll see that it's basically um boils down to being a map with a key text and the, the corresponding um value in there so it's quite straightforward um functionality so and this is one way this is of course a good starting point for having some sort of persistence and you will believe me but even if i restart this of course the data is retained and can be accessed and so on right because remember i'm pointing postman at i at the end point here right so um this is to my local service my local service makes use of firebase in the back end as a back end but provides the data back so there's persistence now uh in short um, any questions to that stage? I just want to motivate briefly how that works, but is there anything unclear as part of this? How big was that free uh, like service? How big is uh, storage? Ah, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, you're asking the right question. Uh, of course, it depends on how much money you pay there. Yeah, but the, I mean, the free one. Uh, I don't, um, hang on. You probably want to look more into um, the interactions that you have because they are more challenging. It's the number of reads and writes that you perform um, that you need to pay for here. There you go. Uh, where your concern about storage comes into play is more on the storage side, because I think they give you, I don't know, a few megabytes or something, and afterwards you need to pay for this. So it's a bit of a constraint, but I don't think you'll get even remotely there. So let's look at Firestore read operations. So of your daily quota, yeah, we're sipping, sitting at 1%. 1% you need to bear in mind, this is more than the query just saw because I played around with this earlier this morning, um, of course. So, uh, but you know, so even on a daily basis, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to go productive with this immediately because you know, then it can exhaust it, but for development and prototyping and what we do here, it's more than sufficient. Um, and um, what else do we have? Um, fetch operations of, of entities. I think it's just counting it. it uh, ah, it, 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 it's part of the daily rate, I suspect. Um, and so on. So there are certain quotas, um, but I have never even come close to those ones. They're actually fairly generous in as far as we are, what we are doing here. And you see already that this uh, platform is completely integrated with the Google Cloud platform. That's Google's cloud offering, right? The, the AWS equivalent. So they're basically uh, backing uh, Firebase with that um, as well. Um, okay, so coming back to Cloud Firestore a bit. So quite straightforward. You have collections, you have uh, documents in there, so in a bit of complexity. So, so that's a bit of an um, interesting arrangement here. So, okay. So, um, what can we do to fancify this a bit? So, what you saw here in the create, perhaps one one aspect there. there. So, in order to um, Right now, I basically just posted messages and retrieved the same messages, right, on bulk, basically, right? So, but one of the key features in REST is, of course, to be able to identify uh, entities as well, right? So, um, to kind of um, have a starting point for um, retrieving entities. So, and those are basically those two ones here. So, this one is um, the reference to an entity that should actually work. And you should be able to be able to print this uh, reference here as well if you wanted to. Let's see. Um, that is generated. I'm going to stringify this possibly. Entry added to collection. Da, 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 da. What am I doing wrong? Uh, what is wrong? Uh, 
Does anyone spot what I did wrong? Um, I'm just concatenating those two things. ID outside N. I saw, right, 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 right. Um, it, no, it's generally not actually subtype string, as you will, as you should have seen. What's the error says? Error says uh, flip change semantics. Uh, yeah, that's not happening. It thinks that I, I picked the fields wrongly of the HTTP error. I just want to print that reference because that should be quite, quite straightforward. Um, ah, right. Uh, hang on. This is the, I, the, let's say, of course, I need to get the full reference. So it's an object itself that has the ID embedded in there. Okay, let's try that again. So. Uh, probably runs so let's let's post another one so just to get uh something out just to show you that you can actually make a reference and here you go there's the string uh, id that you can possibly uh, use for your application so for example if you have like an application you're creating a new identifier you can either map those into your own resources one two three four five student da, 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 or use those identifiers directly in order to make uh you know items um accessible in uh in firebase in as far as um you use them so um, one possible way, for example, but before, uh, yeah, so that's, that's one aspect. Um, but before we turn to that one, I'm not sure if you have the time. I just want to show you to, um, the, the other thing, the other aspect is of course, that we want to make, um, items, uh, you know, selectable. So I just want to motivate the clip querying bit a bit. And that was one of my things on the agenda for today. That's right. Um, so if we have, for example, have a, a counter, right? So it counts, for example, requests, the adding, adding messages and so on. Uh, here's the way we perform a request. We want to increase that counter, but we also embed um, the counter into the messages itself. Um, then we can uh, do so, of course, um, as well. So, because that is the basics then for um, selections that we can do. So I increase the counter every time I have a reference to it and I'm basically injecting it irrespective of the text. So let's restart the service. And what you would see on a server side is that the structure is correspondingly um, changing in the collection. Let's see. Takes a bit. I hope it's running. Yeah. So it creates, so you see it creates uh, various amounts of um, various references um, that are added. And let me just shift to the Firestore. And now we should see all the references here. So we still have the old one, retained one, and those are all the new ones that are added. They all have counters in there. Uh, some of them have counters, some have, don't have counters, right? And that was the earlier question that I got here informally in the break was, you know, what happens if, uh, with divergent structure? What, what, what can you do and what's the problem with this? Or is there any problem with this? Um, and um, there's no problem with this in the sense that it's simply ignored if it's absent. So if we take, for example, here, client collection was basically the query uh, we can do um, various um, various queries. For example, if we are only interested in uh, values with a given uh, counter, hang on, this string the op, so where the counter is greater, let's say I don't know two, you name it, um, doesn't really matter at this stage. Hang on, the value is diff. Um, let's see if that compiles. There you go. Um, then you basically show postman again. Um, if I do a get right now, for example, you get um, that is without restarting the service, you basically get the full content here, right? We could, of course, access this as well and only provide a subset, for example, only the text content if we wanted to. Actually, turn the camera to me a bit. Um, 
But you see that the context is actually fairly mixed. Some of them have counters, some, have do uh, some don't have counters. Um, so let's just restart that service and we can just adjust the query. So it should only get the ones that have a CT value of greater than three. So basically two conditions. One of them you need to have is this one. Second of all, it needs to be greater than three. And that kind of works, right? You could see that it can quite easily reorder, uh, uh, basically do perform some sort of um, queries on um, the data. The other one, um, and this is nice for playing around here, this area, because you can also do things like um, limiting output. Uh, you only want three entries, for example. That does good. Okay, um, so and so on. So it's quite a quite a nice way of modifying it. So essentially, the um, API, and as far as that's relevant, let's go back to the. Um, examples here. The API is quite straightforward, as you find, but that's how it basically works. You kind of bound to um, the structure that you basically have um, in terms of collections documents. You can order uh, things by uh, you know, by name uh, or by whatever, by counter, by any fields, uh, sort of by um, you can have complex queries in there, basically. Um, limits can be invoked um, and so on. So, so quite, a, quite a set uh, of simple and complex queries that you can actually um, use as part of this uh, system. Um, one thing I want to point explicitly to is the use of timestamps, because we can also um, just add Um, time so because that's a bit painful um, and I think we'll need this again sooner or later um, for and how to access it is basically um, using the fire store library by the way um, when you when you run this project in your system uh, your system will be docked down for a bit because you need to download a lot of dependencies which is largely pain free but it's nevertheless uh, quite a number, I don't know how many, but quite quite a bit of megabytes in dependencies that come along with this. But I, um, well, the upside is that you get a reasonably rich um, query, um, oh, reasonably rich functionality that you can use. So that's quite quite nice, actually. Okay, so uh, if you want to use, for example, timestamps, which can be quite um, useful, you can add those as well. I just organize. So I move this limitation here. So, um, and if you, for example, then order by uh, time um, and you order um, organize in ascending or descending order, because if you look at one thing, which is really um, um, a practically relevant concern is that there's no explicit ordering, of course, right? So the um, documents uh, hash is generated and um, the order is um, um, not explicitly retained, at least not in the visual representation, but of course you can verify it based on the um, update time that you provide or the update time that um, also from the server, the update time from the uh, system itself, but to make it more explicit, um, that's the way to go. So does it resolve? Yes, it does. See if it restarts. And then we should see the responses. I guess first I need to add a few more. In order of time. So I removed any sort of constraints, but we'll see now that. Uh, uh, for for the entries that actually contain time, because I introduced this field late, uh, those are actually then ordered, right? So you can use timestamps as well and order your inputs uh, based on this. But the, the what's the story to take away from this? Well, it's easy to use, but super flexible in use as well, right? So because I possibly in a relational model, it has would have violated any sort of constraints that you would put, have put on a system, right? Not filling fields, changing field names, changing conditions, introducing new fields, and so on. 
uh, but nevertheless, the system still still uh, does what it's supposed to do. So, uh, but it only operates on the data that's actually available. That's the that's the main point here. You, in principle, have a lot of uh, functionality um, that you, you find in relational databases. So that would be um, in defining conditions, um, having fully fledged. Um, you know, basically selects there that you can uh, perform. So where conditions particular that you know from your select queries in SQL, for example, you can perform ordering um, and uh, you can also chain ordering. So you could, you know, uh, um, first order ordering, second order ordering um, of responses and so on. You can limit outputs. So it's quite rich in terms of functionality, uh, while at least what you need ad hoc. Um, yeah, so that's uh, one, of, one of the key um, uh, features. And for accessing, um, you basically need to exploit the database. So instead of having a full request, you basically always navigate through that uh, data by indicating the collection you're interested in and uh, element, ele all elements therein, right? So, um, and the API is actually your, um, assisting you quite well in this uh, process. So all documents that I'm embedded in then, in there, or you're perhaps you're only interested in document references, so that would be the IDs themselves, um, and so on. Or create a new document, that's something you can do as well programmatically, so you can create new instance from uh, within here. Cool. And then um, by retrieving the document reference, you can set values or set the content or modify it, so it will be reflected in your database. Um, so quite a rich set of uh, functionality as provided by the API. So considerable buy-in, in a sense, is or lock-in is you are, of course, need to commit to the particular API layout um, of uh, Firebase, right? So um, it's not as generic in terms of um, uh, connectivity as SQL would be, for example, where you can uh, you offer more freeform queries and so on, but it has a considerable linkage to um, this particular um, database solution. Um, I want to, you know, perhaps show implementation of more methods, but I think I leave it at this for the sake of uh, brevity and overview. Um, what what you could do if you wanted to um, kind of try to see how much you need to adapt to actually request individual uh, messages. So, for example, we extracted the or we provide the ID already uh, now when when adding where is it? Yeah, the reference ID. Of course, you could remove all the rest here as well and simply say the body only consists of the ID, which is um, a perfectly sensible, not desirable, but sensible uh, design choice. So every time you add an entry, you just get the ID in return, you fetch the ID and then can uh, request it possibly again. How would you possibly do this in a display function? What would be the modifications you need to do? Anyone? So how would we how would we extract the ID we're searching for in the first place? Well, we generally use the uh, request path, right? So we do something like um, hang on uh, URL path. Right, so because in REST, how um, how would be how, how would IDs be specified? Where do they appear? Let's assume we have messages or we have students, right? And we are, want to retrieve one particular student. How would we address that particular student in student in REST? Yeah, and where does the ID go? Yeah, yeah, no, but but in terms of the request, where, where does it go? Does it go in the body or? Uh, uh, no, it's going to header. In, in the URL it goes, right? Yeah, so yeah. so generally. So you would expect it to be uh, a suffix at, of the path, for example, right? So and the challenge would then be basically to redirect to the data, this to the database and see, okay, how can I uh, extract a um, document only with a particular, um, how do you do this? Quite an abstraction here, yeah. Get there. 
Yeah, and then you have this field um, doc ID. I'm not sure if it picks up on this. Yes, doc ID, and that's where the ID would actually go. So then you would retrieve only that particular reference to that particular document, and then you could return this to the client basically instead of the entire um, collection, right? But you would need to extract it from the path. Path uh, consists of multiple elements, strings, dot split, and you basically um, Uh, this way. Split it on slashes and then uh, get the last bit of that one in order to inject it as an ID and it should get the reference to an individual document. So that would be one way of redirecting REST requests that you get from the URL into the database, for example, right? So the linkage is quite straightforward. Um, anyway, questions? Running out of time. Too much talking. Ah, blinking. What's the blinking? There's a lot of blinking, that's fine. So, uh, where is it? Ah, it shows up here. Yes, very good point. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, yes, I'm talking about not what to do, but what not to do. Very good point. Um, the, 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 the challenges here, um, yes. So when I, when I mentioned earlier, we need to create user accounts um, or uh, system accounts in, in Firestore, you basically download a generated file, right? It's a unique file that you download. Just go back to the website to just briefly motivate this thing. And there we go. Uh, here, project settings, service accounts. Oh, and well, you don't need to click that, but at the bottom here, there should be a create new service account. It's now a bit obscured because of, ah, this is not a good zoom is getting there. So anyway, that's a general private key file thing. So you download this file, it's a JSON format file, right? So you saw it right now in my project, I put it in the main directory. Um, don't commit this, right? Don't commit this to your Git repository. That's the main, uh, main point. Um, generally, it should be uh, added to your Git ignore. So Git ignore files. Right, which basically signals which files in your um, working directory um, should be ignored for for committing. This service account is actually one of those um, because yeah, anyone, anyone who has that file has basically access to your uh, database um, within or without certain constraints because you can also link um, those uh, private keys and uh, constrain access. For example, users can only read or only write because you also have permissions like you have in SQL. On a particular elements, you could say this collection is, you know, only only static can't be modified by that particular user. But nevertheless, they would have access to it. So uh, best practice: put this in the Git ignore and don't commit it to your um, don't commit it to your um, repository. It's just uh, out of uh, boundaries there. So that's not something that's um, supposed to be um, done in the first place. So yeah, that's that's the challenge there. So you would need to require the user or anyone who would possibly download your uh, work to kind of create an own um, or have an own um, file handy, which is cheap to create anyway, uh, and then just use that one. The only problem is there, you can of course not make assumptions that the database is pre-filled in a sense, right? So ideally you would want to have an initialize function that pre-populates the database with everything you want to be in there in case you assume prior state. But unlike SQL, uh, recall, merely the creation of an element can create a collection, right? In SQL you have DDL and SQL, remember? What's DDL for? What's, what's the name? That's a definition language, right? So where you create tables, modify tables, like create, alter, and all that kind of stuff. DDL. Yes, DDL, yeah. So I have a feeling about SQL. Yeah, sorry? Like the alter table, uh, Table, drop table, this is called the yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the SQL? In the it's structured query language. It's only for querying. Okay. So, see, yeah, yeah, okay. so those are two things. The one is more for using an existing schema, and the DL is only for modifying the schema itself, right? Creating tables, dropping tables, creating columns, whatever. Um, so, but here the thing is whole is one giant moosh, right? So there's no differentiation between what creates the table necessarily, 
merely a request to a collection creates the collection, possibly. I mean, in, in terms of creating something, um, but it's not as uh, uh, neat and clear and well and separately defined. Um, so you will need to kind of inject this, uh, of course, into your code base. But fundamentally, yeah, it will be part of the instructions of the user to actually download and create such a service account and link it to your particular instance there. So yeah, yeah, that's the short answer to a very um, um, important question. So it's a very, very good question. Th thanks, Dennis, for bringing this up. I would have forgotten to mention this. Jongrina just mentioned, uh, yeah, some some IDEs and uh, VS Code also allow the addition of such files by, you know, basic effect by right click into git ignore. That's one point. The other point is, um, what was this? What's the site account where you can bootstrap git ignore files? Um, there's, there's basically one site, depending on your programming language and um, the service you use, it can basically pre populate such file. A git ignore file that you can just add to your repo as well but yeah that's one of the files that need to be ignored otherwise people have uh, access to your database very good point other comments questions okay well over time anyway sorry for that one of my best skills being over time and talk fast let's say no Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, GitHub, yeah, provides some of them, uh, depending on what you go for. That's right. Um, programming language and so on. Yeah, no, cool. Um, yeah, make it best practice to be mindful of those ones. Again, you don't need it just to avoid any confusion. You don't need it for this assignment. That would be fun, right? But no, uh, this would be something that you should consider for the second assignment anyway, and possibly your project, because there's a lot of functionality there. And it's not too hard to get it going, uh, to be honest. I'll upload in a clean version that project here uh, onto uh, the Git uh, repository as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, perhaps on Wednesday, I'm not sure if I should talk about some bells and whistles or uh, minor additions. So you have a full example that you can use for your um, future work as well. So you can always reference that one. It's quite handy to have such a, a comprehensive example, I guess. Anyway, cool. Thanks very much for your attention, both online and offline. Um, and uh, see you on Wednesday.